Good afternoon, dear, dear participants, dear viewers of the Central Asia Noble Fest. Today we're going to have an interactive discussion on the very vital topic development of human capital and deliberately it sounds like how can we improve human capital in Central Asia uh, the format uh, it, it won't be any reports uh, it will be like more like a Q&A session or live discussion and a huge call for uh, those who look as watch as there is a window uh, in your browser to ask a question and you are free to ask any questions you want I would like to introduce in the offline and online format several prominent experts in the field of human capital development in particular they represent various aspects of this issue let me introduce a speaker Mr. Shigeo Katsu the president of Nazarbayev University. Let me introduce Mr. Serik Salif, president of Astana International University. Let me introduce Mr. Sai Sadnorbek, who is CEO of BTS Education, and who also a project lead for Atlas of New Profession Kedison Project. And Elmira Aubrey, deputy chief executive officer, Bureau of Continuing Professional Development, Astana International Financial Center. All right, everyone has been introduced. I am David Toganov, and I'm today your moderator. I would like now to ask a question to all of the participants, to our uh, speakers, and then uh, we could go one by one to enlighten the issue. It's been heavily, heavily affected, and I think it's revealed some problematic areas. Uh, I mean, the pandemic, the current COVID-19, and we're still in the middle of it, and we're still not aware whether the second wave is there. And uh, in fact, there is no uh, ready recipe. Uh, how will the state and the business act in the such uh, realm? Please share your thoughts on uh, what you personally and your organization uh, faced. Uh, what sort of questions has it been revealed? How does your spectre of services being changed? Have you revisited radically your agenda? And what has appeared in your agenda? What hasn't ever been introduced before? Who can start? Who can be the first? Who can be the champion? Probably it's worth starting uh, with universities. Nazarbayev University? Okay. Um, thank you very much. I'm very glad to be part of the, uh, of the panel today. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I, unfortunately, uh, just when you started to speak, I think somehow the, the translation went off. I think I understood what you asked, and that is how, you know, we are coping as a university with the COVID-19 uh, fallout and how we are adjusting it, uh, to it and adapting. Am I correct with this question? I guess so. Yes. So, um, of course, um, uh, COVID-19 uh, was in many ways is at the beginning taking to a black swan event for everybody. Uh, here in Kazakhstan, I think it was around Nauru's time when uh, the whole country started to go into lockdown. And it was announced that post, uh, post the Navrus, all educational institutions should shift towards online education. And I, I guess for everybody, it was a pretty much of an abrupt transition and also a lot of adaptation issues came up. Uh, probably I should say that our university in terms of technology and technology environment was still one of the probably uh, was in a, in a slightly better position than many other places. But of course, uh, and, and we basically, after Navruz, shifted everything indeed to online teaching and learning. Um, and uh, the students, obviously, in the beginning were very quite uh, upset because they love to be on campus, they love to inter, you know, mingle with others, uh, with their peer, and so on. It's part of the university experience. Uh, and everybody thought that, okay, in a few months it will be over. <laughs> but of course, it was not the case, actually. Just to be on the, on the, on the, uh, on the uh, careful side, 
early on in May in June we basically already decided also to conduct the whole fall semester online um, and we used the intervening period summer and uh, period summer vacation and everything or the, the students were not there to actually have extensive sessions with our faculty our professors to actually make them uh, much more familiar and train them up on online teaching. Now, online teaching instructions and offline are quite different animals, quite different. And it is not just a matter of trying to show what you do normally in a classroom and videotape it and, and project it. So uh, the pedagogy is quite, quite different. The way that you engage with students has to be different. And the way that you try to adjust to the pace of learning of your students, obviously, also has to be different. So uh, we have been uh, working a lot on these parts. I think um, we, our, our student reactions, as you can always tell, uh, it ranges from, okay, we still would like to be on campus to, okay, actually this works. Um, the, the key issue for us going forward is going to be actually the key issues uh, on uh, how are we going to make sure that the STEM disciplines that require access to laboratories are indeed going to be, going to be uh, carried out uh, without, without impediment. Um, we will. Uh, we are currently. We have set up a task force for the for the spring semester that is studying and going to recommend to management as to how we go, how we're going to 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 organize and conduct the spring semester. I personally think we may move if if, if the the COVID situation is managed, uh, move more towards a hybrid type of of setup where we're going to have continue to have online but with a mix of face-to-face -face, and in particular related to laboratory work and, and the STEM disciplines. Um, the, the obviously, the other dimension that we really have to uh, be concerned about is the, uh, that uh, online means that uh, the on-campus experience uh, that is very important for students and student life is not going to be there and meaning creating of bonds that are, you know lifelong bonds that you create when you're students you know, with your peers and all this. those things are going to be much more tougher to establish so actually uh, we conduct a lot of sessions and, and uh, sort of events with our students online hopefully and preparing them for, for the day that we can all get together i think i've spoken enough at this point but i'm happy to discuss uh, other things i'm also happy to discuss things related in general to human capital investments and human capital indices that some organizations to prepare thank you uh, thank you so much for your insight uh, and response uh, we are about to start our discussion i would like to know opinion uh, what has been transformed of uh, all the speakers now Serik, uh, my question to you your university and pandemic has it been uh, fostered by the pandemic yes of course mr katsu uh, i yeah i can compliment only compliment his uh, remark all those problems that are being brought by pandemic So pretty much standard cases were revealed. And our colleagues and uh, expatriate colleagues uh, were facing almost the same troubles uh, and the response are almost similar. So uh, there is little um, to add from the university perspective. I would like this to provide an insight of uh, our education and uh, pandemic problems. Uh, it's like a catalyzator. It just revealed all the issues that existed and were hidden from us. Uh, out of 1.5 kids throughout the globe, uh, 463 were out of the education system as long as they didn't have access to technical equipment and the internet. So the pandemic showed uh, the inequality that problem touched upon uh, Kazakhstan, of course, not only our students in school, but our students in the universities. Uh, we have many students who are studying online and have various access uh, to online educational sources. So as a matter of fact, pandemic basically uh, revealed the 
problem of physiological incapability of of ours to be uh, learned online because before that we were communicating face to face we were seeing faces of our students and pupils uh, we've seen the emotions and gestures so 5,000 uh, uh, teachers in the one state of the US uh, they were uh, they uh, responded that of course online education uh, causes stress with them. The stress is a state of unexpected that we all face and deal with. The stress is experienced by our teachers, by our, of course, parents that have faced unexpected uh, function of being involved in the educational process of their kids that uh, are at home. And this redistribution of educational functions uh, really caused stress with parents and can you imagine what our kids uh, experience I think they have a they, they triple uh, the stress uh, load on them so surely uh, there are experts that uh, would say that's a new realm uh, when a human uh, would have we would we had a very thick uh, uh, skin and but uh, after that we've learned how to make produce clothes and uh, the skin uh, with the fur became an atavism so some functions of our brain uh, would become an atavism uh, we won't need concentration or memory or, or something else but uh, in general today we really experience hard transition and uh, I'm I do hope that we'll sustain only minimal losses. It's like a broad view on a pandemic and education as a whole. But you highlighted a very important thing that we had a stress that's been accumulated, accumulated systems uh, stress uh, on various levels. What's, what do you think? Who would, who would relieve uh, from that stress? In corporations, there should be, there should be some sort of <laughs> chief stress manager uh, or officer who would personally be responsible for that sort of issue. Yes. Well, the presence of stress, it basically. Well, it, li it lays very good in the context of our today's discussion, I mean, human capital. And uh, who uh, easily deals with stress? Who, uh, who manages stress better? Uh, who knows how to feel emotions and manage those emotions better? Only, po only highly educated person could deal with such uh, sort of things and manage those things uh, with, that possess certain resistivity. But how high is this human capital uh, in the capital that's a very separate topic that i think we will touch upon later on but let me respond on that the stress is managed uh, it could be addressed with a person who can manage that uh, person uh, very often it's a well-educated well -educated person uh, let me just uh, add something on this particular topic mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to Years. This will be actually transferred to the next generation. So the effect of the lack of the lack of the real uh, university and school environment, where the students had to be absent from this real life, from the socialization. So these losses will be felt 
uh, and uh, the losses were actually 60% of uh, the material that they were supposed to learn if they were in schools in reality. And uh, that was the experiment we didn't plan. And I think, and also the research shows that the, this generation will lose 3% of their income in future. And uh, every year, economies of our countries will lose $2 billion because we had such a stress in the school systems. And uh, also, according to the World Bank, about 7 million students will drop out from schools and will not go further to the universities because this was a unprepared transition to online education. And I was afraid of that, and that actually happened. We were not able to show all the advantages. The advantages are there. They are evident of online education. But we showed just the dark side of the moon. So, you know, the schools were not ready and students were not ready, parents were not ready, and there was a lot of stress, stress. and that's why there is a distrust now to online education in many groups. And speaking about, for example, skill of reading, reading is measured, and 20% of this functional literacy, there was a decline by 20% in this functional literacy all over the world. So pandemic was actually a big shock. And in April, May, 193 countries, according to UNESCO, con uh, had to move their schools to online education format. And uh, about 1.5 billion students all over the world had to study online. So there are three more problems that I would like to know now, and we need to resolve them. This is infrastructure project. Not a single country was ready with all the infrastructure, with ICT infrastructure, and uh, of the infrastructure of developing, delivering the knowledge, and that was not ready. The only exception, I think, was China, because just within very short time moved 180 million of its school students moved to online education, and that was a lot of effort done by the administrative system. So Alibaba, Huawei, all the biggest Chinese companies, they were included into this work. Engineers were working on that. The second problem is even deeper. That's the competences of uh, the teachers. They are the, actually, so that was the most difficult for them. The, to, to move to the digital format was the most difficult for them. So actually, the mankind is now moving to the digital model, and they face the teachers all over the world, not only in Kazakhstan, face them with three demands, very strict demands. First is the digital literacy. Now, a teacher, any average teacher, should be should have very high level of digital literacy to be able to organize its job digitally, use the new digital instruments for teaching, evaluation of its, its students. Then the second is the quality of the content to the digital environment, teachers had to develop the content, digital content. They have to compete with the, such industries as Netflix, TikTok, and Instagram. Their content should be interactive, should catch the attention of children, use the game practices, and they have to commit, uh, compete with the better prepared industries. And the third one, there's uh, the new requirements for the emotional intelligence. We now, the teachers need to manage their emotional intelligence because they get tired much quicker, stressed much quicker. I'm looking at my reflection in the screen and I'm talking as if to myself. And the mind, brain is actually working 
working too hard now, and there is a lot of research that is now showing that, proving that. So this transition to the digital format is very taxing for our psychology and for our brain, and brain is not ready, is not keeping up with this adaptation because there's a lack of emotional contact, lack of interest, and the brain is not able to keep up with it and actually experiencing kind of a panic. And when we are able to fully move to the digital format, this transition without resolving all these difficult infrastructural issues, issues related to competences and uh, many other issues. That's, so this transition is actually very difficult. We are just starting to understanding that the research is just starting and there is new developments such as human-computer interaction. There are many issues coming up which we never had to deal with before. Before we would just talk person to person and now we have to deal with bots, algorithms, artificial intelligence, data collection. We have to deal with machines and uh, there are absolutely new area of work is done, human-computer interaction, how these interaction models will be changed. So we are getting into the very interesting period, the third decade of the 21st century, and uh, there will be serious transformations happening in education and in uh, healthcare. We are studying this now. There will be new skills needed and there will be changes in the labor market. Yes, I said, thank you very much. Now I would like to uh, talk about your bureau. You talked about infrastructure and competences. Elmiro represents the bureau. And uh, so they trained and retrained uh, experts, providing them with new skills. There were thousands of uh, people, experts, students who received the skills of the future. And during this transformation time, your bureau, how it was affected by the pandemic. And here in the Sparrow, everything was focused on interactive education. And now, during these six months, there was no one here in this room. So, how you were able to switch to hybrid online format? How do you plan to fulfill this goal to teach your hundreds of students? Thank you very much. That was a very interesting question. I would like to summarize what my colleagues said. But still, I would like to be optimistic and uh, final talk about this more optimistically. Pandemic for Kazakhstan and for the Bureau actually was a positive risk. Risks are not always negative, and this was a black swan, of course. As Nasib Talib wrote in his book, he said that there are such some events that ha make the whole world to upgrade. So everything is cyclical and not permanent. And what my colleague said, this is all right. And of course, there is a digital gap and inequality and uh, unpreparedness of education system. But understanding of uh, educational technologies, I think now this is raised to all the levels, to the levels of decision-making people. And this is very good. At the same time, during the pandemic, the Bureau conducted the educational forum that was at the very peak of the pandemic, and we discussed, we had expressed different opinions, hopes, and what my colleague said, that was absolutely right. And uh, I think we would upgrade the system finally, and we will find the new ways to make 
education, person-centered, targeted, and uh, we will ensure the reverse socialization when uh, the students will come back to schools after online education. And how can we make this uh, socialization, this coming back to them more comfortable? And when they have to go back again to online education, make it less painful for them. Then there is a fact of uh, launching online school for programmers. We call it a school of high technologies named Quant. This is an unprecedented case. Within two weeks, we had to change the content. We had to change the approach. And uh, so change this content to make it more emotional. But we didn't have time to be panicking, and that's we just did it. And we are very happy about it. Our program is now covering more than 1,000 students all over Kazakhstan regions, even the most remote ones, such as Ayagos and small villages at the south of Kazakhstan. And they all have equal conditions. They all are connected to the systems of the US, Australia, and they all have equal opportunities with students of the world. So we are expanding our borders and we get new space for imagination and looking for new solutions. I also think that now will be very relevant to change the approach for methodologies, teaching methodologies. There is a active teaching approach, very active now, very popular now. It shouldn't be a monologue anymore. A teacher shouldn't be just standing in front of the class and uh, providing some information. There should be active process. Every student should be participating in interaction. So, we should use the most modern approaches such as project teaching, mentorship, peer-to-peer -peer teaching, equal knowledge exchange. When you don't just receive knowledge, but when you are able to share your experience, and you can also improve your skills and help your classmates. Once again, gamification, we're just a bit away from the classical standard of information provision. I think we're going to another realm where the entertainment becomes an uh, integral part of the education. And yes, we have to uh, face the hard truth. We have to change a lot. We have to learn new things. A lot of information shall be uh, put through us. But I think we shouldn't be worried and question uh, if it's the person or a machine. I think we will find this fragile balance where uh, digitalization of process will make us more anthropocentric, more creative. Um, and we'll be, uh, while we were looking for the uh, approaches in the sphere of education, um, just uh, I would like to highlight those things. Um, let's let's just uh, daydream that we have one, two year and the infrastructure will be all uh, settled by the government and we will settle the competencies issues. Our teachers will learn hybrid format, emotional intellect will be improved by the parents. What else? Uh, so what? So human capital. That's the topic of today's session. It's an important aspect and I think everyone would agree. It's a very um, it's it's uh, it, which which is asked behind the scenes. It's a uh, uh, brain leakage. Uh, I know that today's experts, you all work uh, in the education sphere for a long time, and you're in person 
touch those figures, you know uh, what behind those stati statistics is. I think, Shigeo, you know, I know that you're tracking the future, uh, the the uh, your, of your students. I think Saya Sato worked quite a while in the uh, educational center. Seric, I think you were actively involved. I think you were working in a state uh, education system. You were responsible for quality control in the education. Uh, what's the scale of this uh, catastrophe in the education? How does pandemic affected us? Uh, has it dramatically affected uh, the brain leakage? Uh, would you please share your thoughts on this topical issue? I think uh, Sayasat or Shigeo can start. Hope is only now starting to play out in terms of for the first time. It's only now that we start to get some baselines in terms of the pre-COVID versus post-COVID or current COVID period in terms of education, health, and other outcomes. Um, when it comes specifically to, to uh, let's say, what often is called the, uh, uh, the, the brain drain of, of young people here who leave, um, for one thing, I mean, uh, logistically, international flights were closed for a long time. So we see many of the students, not just our own, uh, but also students throughout the country who otherwise would have gone abroad. At least this year, they're actually studying here in Kazakhstan. Um, the question is, how are we all going to be able to keep them here rather than uh, them leaving at the first opportunity that uh, borders are open, flights are available, and so on and so on. Uh, so that sort of is maybe the immediate uh, challenge, and uh, as Sayasat and others have indicated, uh, we really have to embrace uh, technology, we have to embrace uh, digital environment that we are you know, part of increasingly, um, and, and make it as interesting to our students as possible. Now, uh, a different dimension is obviously our graduates. Now, graduates, uh, whether they leave the country or not. Now, in our case, uh, I can mostly only speak for, for Nazarbayev University, about between one third to 40%, so uh, continue graduate studies. And a good number of them go to, uh, fortunately, admitted in top international universities. So they are, uh, you know, what you would, maybe many people would wonder whether Will they come? Or they will come back or not? But of course, um, what we want is, especially as a research-oriented university, we always feel that it is good to 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 experience what other universities do, to learn, and so don't forget your alma mater, Nazarbayev University, but you know, study elsewhere, acquire as much as possible. And if your heart is in research and so, okay, get your advanced doctoral degree and then come back you know, uh, to, to build uh, further the university, but also continue to build the country. Um, we are now six years into, uh, after having uh, had our first cohort uh, out. Um, and so we start to see some of our doctoral students who are now graduating. And they have indeed uh, started to show a lot of interest in coming back, which is very good. Um, and uh, it shows us that, number one, I think young people, although they want to experience the world, they love to come back to Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan is their home. And we have to all make sure that the environment is going to be as conducive as possible. In our case, it means we want to create an environment, we are building it, where uh, those who, who get their advanced degrees abroad come back and feel that they can do research, feel that they can, you know, uh, engage with their peer groups and so can do advanced research and, you know, share their experience back with the younger students here. And uh, an important tool that we therefore also have uh, introduced a few years ago is uh, a systematically a postdoc system, a postdoctoral scholar system, 
whereby we are uh, opening up postdoctoral scholarships to, uh, to, in many ways, to the Kazakhstani diaspora studying abroad. We want to bring them back, offering them the postdoc positions. Of course, we will also uh, open, we are opening uh, it also up for international uh, postdocs. But you know, for us, it's a way to try to get our young Kazakhstani, highly educated uh, researchers, and so to try to get them back so that they have a foothold here. Back in so the experience so far is very good. Um, and uh, so so I'm actually quite optimistic in the ability to bring back you know, the young talent. But also Kazakhstan, in order to compete for the future uh, in terms of human capital and, uh, you know, Kazakhstan as it transitions into very knowledge-intensive, knowledge-intensive, advanced uh, knowledge economy. With 18 million people uh, as a total population, you know, it's not enough. So Kazakhstan has today to stay open and make itself the most attractive place here in Eurasia, or no Sultan, wherever in, uh, in Kazakhstan, make itself the most attractive place where international talent and international brain comes here. Okay? Um, because that's how, how uh, we can make sure that overall uh, as a country we can move forward. In terms of the job, uh, those, you know, about uh, half, 55%, 60% going to the job market. Uh, and I'm, I'm actually able to report that 90% approximately of those who go to the job market actually are working here. And so I'm, I'm actually in a way less, less uh, worried with the exception of one particular job stream, and I'm sure that says that uh, or Elvira immediately can pinpoint, those are the data scientists. You know, they, there is a huge competition globally for anybody who can manage data, who can also code, who can analyze, you know, that's a cutting edge. Everything is based on data. It's a data economy. There's a huge competition globally. And uh, it's a fact that, you know, our students are recruited away by the Googles, by, you know, Microsoft and so globally. Uh, even companies from Japan recently came, interviewed 10 people and offered them all and then boom, they, they decided to go there. So uh, in a way, it's a price of success of showing the world that Kazakhstan has very talented, you know, talented generation. Um, the talent is here. Um, hopefully, uh, we will continue to build this environment whereby young people, they may go abroad, cut their teeth, get their experience abroad, even in the digital uh, world, or digital jobs. But hopefully, we will create this environment where we will come back. And for that, Kazakhstan has to be connected to the world. Sorry for my long explanation, but I'm optimistic. Also. Uh, David, thank, David, thank you, you so much. Uh, may, may I just uh, continue? Yeah, please. There was a specific uh, comment on data science. First of all, I personally think that, that uh, there, there is a stage in the development of educational system of Kyrgyzstan. We have to, uh, to, to convey discussions, uh, very uh, topical discussions on a model of uh, the education. I think more frequently, and all the participants would support me and those who view us and watch. Uh, I think it's, it's essential radically to revisit uh, current educational system. I think this complicated society will, uh, uh, will require this uh, crossroad com companies and a total uh, model of total um, transfer uh, for the whole life period. Such experiments has been already initiated uh, in the, uh, all over the globe, and Mr. Katz, I think, is aware of such experiments, or OECD, OECD has launched 
Transition Experience, uh, so-called Education 2030. It's um, been started in 2010, so where we where they search uh, an absolutely brand new model. J just in two words, how would they understand such a process? Atlas of new professions in test and some de new demands, some new competences have uh, been uh, requested by the business, by the industry, that even now are uh, not catching up uh, in full scale to react. And the major comment, it's impossible to prepare for the life. Uh, everything is changing too rapidly, uh, too fast. I think uh, the education should last during the whole life period. I think the student himself or herself should understand the area of, her, of his focus and uh, be ready to study, study and study. Education is not a professional training at all. Uh, it should incorporate all life spheres, not only um, talking about uh, an, an amount of knowledge uh, and just fixing this amount of knowledge uh, by receiving some marks. It should cover such vital baseline uh, uh, skills like financial literacy, uh, IT, ICT literacy, uh, which then would be of the highest demand by the society and life. So baseline baseline competencies and uh, life important uh, skills and that's the project so what we what, that's why we're mentioning the com method of competencies uh, of professional skills of for example digital uh, literacy uh, the earlier we can form it the better for the society so integration should be also part of the health uh, management system so many uh, and millions of people they just um, do not pay enough attention to their health so uh, they uh, just they even are not aware how to put their mask correctly. So the situation with the pandemic uh, basically will t tells us uh, will be as a cyclical process. So correspondingly, the quality of the educational process uh, will partially linked with the stress, empathy. It should be center of the educational system itself. So basically, we have to well, the debate is really of the close this topic is so close to you know, where the uh, education should be human oriented first of all where uh, the collective learning trajectory I mean which uh, uh, covers all the themes that uh, especially uh, so uh, the child would uh, accept a uh, kid would accept him as a part of this system it will be uh, all supported with individual strategy so me myself uh, as a subject of my individual, my my unique characteristics, what I do personally like. So, so uh, to my sheer um, success and to my sheer happiness, uh, the education gives us such opportunity. It gives us a lot of opportunities to personalize the education. So the digital education enables us to do that. There are some new forms. Uh, so unfortunately, but, uh, we uh, cannot uh, leverage uh, in full uh, such things. One more important, important key change is assessment. So the the assessment system uh, we have now, the attestation certification uh, which we have in Kyrgyzstan, is just doesn't match the reality. So uh, the situation is that the whole formal situation, formal situation does not reflect, is not interrelated with real life. ENT, uh, education and uh, uh, testing systems they, they, they are not they have nothing to do with the real life so if a person comes if a person comes uh, well the education model is certified uh, it's been proven by uh, some authorities but it's it's definitely validated we don't have a clear understanding uh, so what does it mean to have, for example, a gold medal or Altenbilge? So I think politicians would be of the greater help uh, to uh, to congest uh, the system with more data uh, to understand where we have uh, bottlenecks, where we have problems, so we could address those challenges. Yeah. So uh, the summative uh, assessment uh, is the end of this uh, by the end of the quarter. 
uh, where the people uh, where uh, teachers understand that 75% of their class uh, didn't, uh, call, didn't catch uh, the content. So uh, the large per percent of people then at the end of the day uh, there's not enough knowledge at the end of their process. One more moment, uh, very important, the last but not the least. Uh, no, today we start a very interesting period in the education system. It's a gl global platforms arise and uh, the subnational standards are in place uh, the, which are able to improve there are non-formal educations uh, that delivers uh, via TikTok and all other social media uh, a large number of new formats uh, uh, develop uh, develop so and here we, I think there should be uh, I mean uh, from our perspective we have to establish not vertical but uh, horizontal society or ecosystems that would leverage all the advantages of non-standard approaches uh, that exist in the environment in our environment so for example from hierarchical hierarchical uh, model we have to go to systematic but it's it, it should not look like a top-down approach no but it should be like a, um, a scanning system uh, with uh, grants uh, with competitions uh, that would promote innovators uh, so people would have a chance to test their ideas and to test their innovations and then give them a chance to be on top so it's really important to create uh, to create a society that holds new paradigms of the education of uh, so innovators uh, would be accumulated and would give a chance to proclaim about themselves so in various situations economic situations are uh, given uh, the regional peculiarities so they would be able to uh, clearly uh, to redistribute such resource and education at the end of the day it's a key topic uh, or key thing it should be a key tool uh, in economical development Both both at the national level and regional levels. So state uh, actors, uh, uh, industry leaders or regional uh, leaders, they should understand that education is a key resource, it's a key tool. Uh, it's basically key KPI uh, that should be uh, an access for his of his platform of his activity and correspondingly I think we have to start this talk uh, how would the new model should look like we shouldn't be afraid of something of course there would be a huge risk uh, a huge risk in a corporate uh, environment, for example, or you would violate some some uh, acts. All the reforms that we had during the last uh, 10 or 15 years, they were based on the old system. And we were trying just to do some cosmetical repairs, some minor repairs, uh, just to make sort of a t tuning. No, I think we have to question in a different manner. How would we really reform the educational system? What the new structure would look like in the future? And I think we have to start uh, the discussion now. Uh, just the, uh, the uh, minute of uh, ad advertisement, the Atlas of New Professions, Kedestan, uh, would uh, facilitate to um, channel and streamline this discussion because uh, we've done a great job on all the industries we did the analysis how uh, the demands are changing given the opinions of more than uh, 2,000 industrial experts uh, including key ministries in the nearest future in, in five or ten years what the demands will be first of all uh, we talk about professional and technical education we just build the platform now on how, uh, where uh, every uh, very person in this educational system would understand to correct uh, the educational curricula and how to establish a new educational curricula. We in detail uh, dive into every profession, uh, we dive in every set of skills and we could show you how that's the set of skills you would need in the future, uh, that's the educational curricula you would need in the future and so on. Also. <laughs> Is this okay?
So can we just finish discussing this issue and then we'll get back to that uh, systemic issues well, that I um, had raised? Yeah, um, I think uh, I've, I've been an observer of Kazakhstan for quite a number of years. Um, and one thing that I certainly always admired about Kazakhstan, in particular the education system, it's as part of the way that Kazakhstan did reforms uh, in the 90s to the 2000s was, it was not afraid to experiment. No? So that's it's not by happenstance that Kazakhstan introduced private participation in education, private sector. It introduced uh, probably the first country in the, in the region, a unified uh, test, national test platforms and so on. It was the first uh, country that has been experimenting and opening up different forms of schools or universities within a given grade, no structure and so on. And, and, and that has helped and has been really contributing a lot to Kazakhstan. And I think, uh, as, as Sayasat said, now is the time to look forward and not be afraid of experiment. No, I think it, it really is important that we allow different forms of educational approaches to flourish side by side in a way and not be afraid. And uh, just to give you a little sense of, uh, you know, uh, the pre-COVID situation, um, the, the Nazarbayev Intellectual School System, our sister organization, actually in the 2018 PISA exercise, with, as you know, PISA uh, compares uh, education outcomes, learning outcomes in math, literacy, reading, and natural sciences, and so across countries. And the niche system itself, the 20 schools of niche, on average, scored uh, in math, they scored number three or four, the global average. In uh, natural sciences, uh, Kazakhstan was in the top five, or niche was in the top five. And in reading, within the top 10. So way above actually OECD averages, just as a proof that if you want, you can do it here. Yeah. Okay? There are world-class institutions here. The, the not so positive side, well, the positive side also is that the niche system is not actively piloting and being part of this OECD Education 2030 blueprint and so on, and creating a much more student-centered approach to education. Now, the flip side, obviously, of it was that overall Kazakhstan's average in the PISA exercise actually dropped. And the gap uh, with the average, global average, started to be bigger pre-COVID. And uh, obviously now, given all the constraints that we have heard, well, the real concern is that the mainstream schools' performance is slipping. And that is going to have a huge decade-long impact. Uh, for this generation in the future, because as also says, as rightly said, it's going to have an impact over decades. And this is what we have to guard against. We have to really focus on how are we going to raise the quality of education from preschool, primary, elementary school, secondary school, all the way to tertiary for the mainstream. That's going to be a key, key challenge. And for that, we need to experiment. I would like to give floor about the leakage. Uh, what is your view? Yes, let's get back to the question of our moderator. <laughs> So, responding to this question, I would like to give some historical notes. There is a good book of the German anthropologist that researched the territory of Central Asia and uh, that also covers Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan and partially Afghanistan. 
part of China and, of course, Kazakhstan. And he studied the history and he wrote a very good book that is called Lost Enlightenment, the Golden Age of Central Asia before Tamerlan time. I recommend you this book. But to summarize, I would like to say that we shouldn't be afraid just uh, the brain drain because this is the inevitable process of the global integration. And it happened before, historically, when our biggest minds, our sons of the Central Asia, such as Al-Bukhari and, of course, Al-Farabi, and we had a uh, having his anniversary this year, they became famous when they were working together with international scientific community. For example, they worked at uh, the Arab Khalifat Baghdad, and Central Asia would receive the scientists from all over the world, the enlighters, here in the, the Central Asia. So when somebody is going away from the country, they still remain to be part of Kazakhstan, and they still have that DNA code, and they introduce it to the world. And uh, we are very proud to hear when Kazakhstan students uh, win some scholarships, for example, or when we hear about Kazakhstan scientists who he or she did some discovery. So they actually shed light on Kazakhstan. And if, but still, this is quite disturbing that we still do have the brain drain that our students moving abroad, but that should be the civil society uh, dealing with that. That's the issue of uh, raising the importance of patriotic feelings. Then we won't need to actually uh, keep someone here. This will all be voluntary, and I think that will be good for everybody. Yes, thank you very much. And I would like also to answer your question. You actually touched my most sensitive topic. 100,000 of Kazakhstani, Kazakhstani citizens study in uh, 130 countries of the world. And uh, this is not actually covering Chinese statistics. And this is all according to the globalized trends. In 1976, there were only 600,000 young people who were studying abroad. Last year, it already shows that 20 million of students worldwide study abroad. And uh, sorry, I said fi sorry, 5 million. And by 2025, there will be 7 million. So everybody thinks that's okay. But I don't agree with Elmira, and I'm actually quite fearful about this, because that's very good when our 100,000 of young people go abroad, get the knowledge, and uh, introduce the DNA there, and come back and transform our country. That's great. But the reality is different. All these 100,000 students divided into three categories. First is uh, the best students, they stay there. They less smart, they lose their civil identity, ethnical identity. And the third category, they actually um, don't show Kazakhstan in the best of light. So they are there abroad, but they are not needed there. Then they study for four or five years there. They are not getting involved in their activities that would tie them to Kazakhstan. And uh, when they come back, they have mm, no what is awaiting for them here nobody knows so i think there are two solutions here maybe we should establish some world association of a um, kind of students who study abroad and second also we don't need to reinvent the wheel 
they should be international campus. Uh, like Nazarbayev University is the in campus of international universities here in Kazakhstan. We have also such examples of Kazakhstan, Turkish, Kazakhstan, British universities. And the number of such campuses is growing all over the world. The government is providing opportunities for its citizens to get good education but inside the country and uh, still be tied to the roots of your country. So that's the, uh, the answer to the questions about the brain drain. But even if we physically keep our students from going abroad, they will still learn online in international universities because uh, there is the good access to digital content of international universities. So, of course, I, with due respect to your opinion, I see that this is a great significance that we need to resolve this issue but you we cannot put we cannot strength uh, forcefully keep students here that won't help we need just to keep uh, education more popular and we should uh, also reinforce patriotic feelings i didn't say about forceful keeping i just provided some recommendations of uh, engaging students more in the country. Yes, I agree with you. We have the association of uh, uh, Kazakhstan students who graduated from Britain universities. Yes, I agree with you. Okay. Well, not just the countries, but cities compete for talent. Look at Berlin, how they accelerate startups. Also look at Moscow. Moscow is actually attracting talent. And if we compare two countries, Israel, Israel is surrounded by enemies, it is in the desert, it doesn't have sources of water, but what kind of talents and expert services they have. And in Kazakhstan, we have uh, all kinds of natural resources, it's a huge country, ninth largest, but the human capital is we have issues with it and we need to deal with it systematically and the government should help so how we can receive this synergy for this good effect i am not quite agree with shigeo i think he uh, he mentioned only niche nis <laughs> no just as an example just an example yeah <laughs> But yeah, anyway, in, uh, there is P P PRX, uh, I mean the other index, the all indexes they published uh, uh, last year, I think uh, last year uh, we also outsiders, the five uh, international studies say that we are outsiders, we she are outsiders, it's, it's a, a very compelling um, call for us the state does the state does many things and does a lot to develop the education system it will take a lot of time it's a number dozens of pages but uh, it's obvious that these men is not yet enough uh, but in we're still outsiders in reading mathematics natural science ICT competencies of students and adults the we shouldn't and we invent a wheel but as long as Nobel uh, laureate and many prominent economists and science have already provided us with the recipe and the we have to invest into human capital into education as their primary measure of human capital I think everything I think Paul Romer, I think in 1986, has uh, proven his theory and he has been given, uh, awarded a Nobel Prize. Let's follow uh, the advices of our respected uh, Nobel Prize winners. And the other thing, the education shall be uh, the cornerstone and a root daily routine and a long-term political uh, priority of our state, the president, the head of state, the prime minister and leaders at all levels, every single pedagogue, uh, teacher and parent shall um, fall asleep with the idea. What did I do uh, with, to education? And then be awake uh, with the idea, what will I do? So historically, retrospective uh, examples, we could, I could just uh, tell you a lot uh, and provide with many examples. 
uh, where especially those countries who are on the top and the uh, success uh, indices. We're doing the um, researches with the uh, front Soros Foundation, Kazakhstan. I think with this study, uh, we're also conducting studying with the first president, the foundation. There is a huge correlation between very strict correlation between the education system and uh, achievements in the global competitiveness index of the World Economic Forum. The correlation is 0.86, which is statistically important. There is a correlation of uh, education uh, index with the happiness index. So the happier you are, the more educated you are. The more educated, uh, the less corrupted the society is. So, so far, when we are not that educated, we are not that happy, and we are not that peaceful. So we are very very corrupted. What shall we do? Invest into education. As a follow-up question, how how much shall we increase the investment? To my memory, the education system was not funded in the Kazakhstan uh, more than 4.1% uh, uh, of GDP. I think three or uh, three point six. Where at initial educations, they they recommend from five to seven percent. Is the Luxembourg? Uh, do they just allocate nine percent of the GDP to, into the educational system? And how those northern European countries invest in the educational systems? Uh, given their GDP, if we compare their GDP and our GDP. So these chronic disease named under financing of our educational system is a prolonged and a very extensive effect on our economy, on our uh, so sovereignty, or if you may please, if you might put independence. Uh, people uh, basically resolve and their top priority. All the pr policies, Kazakhstan 2030, Kazakhstan 2050, uh, 2050, and uh, we have to increase the inv the volume uh, and allocation of investments, say, t twice. Not only investments, though, but five systematic problems, uh, which uh, there are problems in the quality of uh, state governance, uh, state uh, educational governance. Uh, we have uh, the problem with the uh, status of the teacher, which is addressed by the state now. Uh, those issues, they are well identified. We have to systematically uh, work on them and address them. Uh, I think organizers tell us that we're about to uh, Comp to finish our live broadcast. Uh, what we do now, I think, those questions that been uh, that been mentioned in the chat, then we'll uh, we'll publish it on the web page where we broadcast, and tomorrow you would receive a. Uh, from the speakers and possibly you would receive different views from them uh, on these topical issues. I would like to sh thank my uh, our experts who are offline, who are online as well. Uh, thank you so much. But to first of all, to the participants who uh, found, found time to join us, I hope that those recommendations and principles that were highlighted earlier today would uh, f would find uh, their viewers and those decision makers that really decide in our country and would make them think about privatization and investments and budget allocation. Uh, I really am really thankful to all of you. Thank you so much, dear speakers. Thank you.